All right, so this is where we last left off, right? We just finished um, journalizing uh, our um, counter and display shelves, right? We learned that these are fixed assets, so that means we need to split the tax and we need to split the shipping accordingly. So that's what uh, that's what exactly what we've done here, right? We were able to calculate what those things are. We entered them into our journal, entered them into our uh, ledger and our um, our subsidiary ledger. Okay. Now the last thing that we didn't that we forgot to do here is well, since we ordered this item, right? We need to verify that we received those items. So what you need to do is you need to go to your purchase orders and you need to go ahead and view what you have ordered. So right now, we ordered from Furniture Store. Did we receive our desk set? No, not yet. But we did end up receiving our counter and display shelves, right? Right, that way you can verify, did you receive one counter and five display shelves? In this case, yes, we did. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to go all the way to the right column because now it's going to ask you the date that you received this item and what invoice number was it. Okay, so this is a way that you can use whoever is the purchasing manager, right? They can confirm that this um, that this company that you sent a purchase order to has received your order and has properly um, shipped you all the items correctly, right? Because there's always going to be an occasion where you might end up getting the wrong product, vice versa, or you might end up, right, receiving half the items and then you're still pending on the other half, right? Because in that kind of situation, if you are going to be getting a half package, what usually happens meaning that that current company is currently out of stock or they are, um, they are currently back ordered. So meaning they'll send you what they can, right? And then eventually within that week or so, they'll usually notify you um, whether they received uh, the, um, the, your items or not to be able to send it to you. But if not, usually most cases they'll, they'll verify with you, do you still want to continue with this order or would you like for us to reimburse you for the other part that we did not send. So there's a lot of different, there's a, there's a reason why we have purchase orders and why we have to make sure that we do receive from this uh, vendor and everything that is there is there, right? That is our, that is a job for the purchasing manager to ensure that whatever that they ordered, that they receive because at the end of the day, right, if you're ordering left and right, right, you want to make sure that you don't actually overspend too much money, right? Because uh, we understand that this is to build our business, but at the end of the day, you never want to order too much of something and then end up overstating your assets and then causing your assets to, you know, um, Right, you won't be able to turn around and receive money very soon, or in a, and vice versa. Okay, so in this case, that's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and well, we did receive our um, counter and display shelves. We received it on June seven. Okay. All right, so I need to um, fix the formatting on this. Let me see. Right, I want it to be a date, okay, for January 7th, I'm sorry, June 7th, right, and what was the invoice number that you received? Well, in this case, it was invoice number 69, okay, so again, as our duties who's trying to help Bob here run his business, he doesn't have any other employee except for himself, right? And then for you, you're just his friend that's helping him keep track of his uh, income and expenses. So in this case, this would be technically whoever is in charge of purchases, okay? So in this case, I'm keeping track of all the items that Mr. Bob has uh, purchased, and I'm keeping track by 
ensuring that we receive those items. So in this case, we are completely done there. So I can go back to my journal and I can go ahead and finish up and or be completely done with this transaction here. Okay. So then here, right, on, a, on a June 7th, right, we end up redoing another purchase order for purchase order number 304 to Furniture Store again. And this time, we bought 10 sets of one Bisto table and two chairs, okay? So in this case, um, it's a set, okay? So in this case, we got 10 sets of the one table um, with the two chair set. Per unit price is gonna be $605.55. So that gave us to a grand total of $6,055.50, okay? So I'm gonna go back to my purchase orders here because I just purchased another item. So today is the seven, right? Who did we purchase from? In this case, we purchased from Furniture Store. Okay. What did we buy? We bought table and chairs. Okay, if you want to be specific, one table, two chairs. Okay. How many did we buy? Well, we bought 10 sets. Okay. And what were they quoted per set? They were $605.50 each. So that gave us a grand total of the 6000 And again, this one, because we only have one item, I usually just copy that cell down all the way instead of doing an equal sum here. All right? All right, so the total amount is $6,055.50. Wait, 50 cents? Wait. What did I put here? Six thousand six hundred oh and fifty-five cents. Six oh five fifty-five. That's gonna there you go. Now it's the six thousand fifty-five dollars and fifty cents. Right? So in this case, now we needed a we need to be pending on when we will receive those tables and chairs. Okay. All right, so let's see what happened next. Okay. The down payment check written for Haley Bros on the 6th of June was for the wrong amount okay issue a revised purchase order number 17303r okay and void the check number 1506 and reissue a new check for the correct amount $1171.87 okay so in this case right we wrote the wrong amount of check because in this case it was we we originally wrote it for what one thousand one hundred and forty dollars and twenty two cents or something like that turns out someone didn't do the math right so in this case bob didn't do the math right he probably i don't know he probably divided one of them wrong i don't know what the situation was but we end up writing the wrong check so we need to revise this check and void the check and then reissue a new check. So in this case, right, how do we fix this error? What should we do to fix this error in our journals? Well, you need to go to your, um, your check register has to show that you voided that check and issued the new one. Okay. And your very journal will need to show um, putting, don't you reverse it, you put the money back into checking and make a note that that check was voided and then reissue it? Correct. So in this case, we're going to be using the reverse and re-entry um, way to error, to correct our error, right? 
because in this case we need to reissue the check. Now, when you void a check, what happens when you void a check? Well, the money goes back in because the loan had to come out Cor for that check. Correct, correct. So in this case, right, we would have to reverse the entry anyways because we're gonna void the check. So in this case, that means the money is gonna go back to my checking account, right? Now, how much did I actually write that check out for? Where would, where would I be able to find where I wrote that check and how much I wrote it out for? The check register. You can find it from the check register. That's one way. What's another way? It'd be, well, no, not purchase orders. We didn't put the down payment on the purchase order. It would be in your, your subsidiary ledger because we made a payment to Haley Bros. And now we need to void the check and reissue a new one. So in this case, here's check number 1506. How do I void it in this case? Go ahead and put in void. And I'm gonna actually have that in the color red just so then you know that this is actually voided, okay? Now, if you're gonna be doing this manually, you are gonna unfortunately have to call the bank and actually physically void it, right? You can't expect your Excel spreadsheet to do it for you, right? And then on top of that, if you use QuickBooks, you're gonna to have to need to use some kind of system to be able to or some kind of service, right, merchant service to be able to uh, to void it on that end too. But in this case, if you're gonna be doing everything manually, you actually have to call the bank and actually tell them, I'm going to void this check. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. In my books, I'm recording that this check is voided. Now, what happens when a check is voided versus deleting this check? If I were to just get rid of this check, right, what would happen? What's the difference between voiding and deleting? Voiding keeps it in the records for, for um, audit purposes and everything else. If you delete it, there's no record of it anymore. Exactly, right? In this case, would it be appropriate to, go to if I deleted this transaction right here, if, would it be appropriate to have check number 1505 and then check number 1507, 1508? Then, right, in... IRS terminology, that means what it happened to check number 1506? Did you pay somebody? Did it go somewhere? Where did it go? So in this case, voiding is your best option because you don't want to delete any information here, right? Now, for practice purposes only, since this isn't like a real operating system, right? You can delete your transactions, you can void them. But in this case, we purposely are voiding a check, right? We're saying, we're calling the bank and saying, hey, I need you to cancel this check um, even though I already sent it out. Um, I want this check to not be able to have this vendor put it in into their checking account, right? I want it to be voided, right? Because I'm going to reissue a new one. So that is one also sole purpose of having that too is that we already sent the check out to this, these people. And when, we, when they call us to find out that we sent the wrong amount, they have a possibility to also put that uh, check into their bank account and end up getting a double payment from us, right? Which, no, I'm not going to let that happen. So it's also a preventative measure, too, to, uh, to prevent your uh, vendor from also taking more money from you, right? By you voiding the check. So then if they do put that, sec that first check in there, it will not go through because you voided the check on your end. So in this case, that is absolutely true. We need to be able to do that, okay? Now, in this case, right, I it's it's for the total amount of the eleven forty and twenty two cents. Now, in this case, do we know since we're that money's going to come back to us eleven forty and twenty two cents, right? Do I know where I put that amount in? If I'm going to be reversing this transaction, right, because I'm voiding the check, the money's gonna go back to my checking account. Where did I originally designate this 11.40 and 22 cents for, into? Where did I, 
we put it in a prepaid account because that is what constitutes to our down payment. So in this case, we're going to reverse the entry. And that means we're going to undo it, means we're going to take that money out from the prepaid accounts account, okay, which is 18600 right? Now, here, this is where I'm going to make a note right here saying that I am going to undo this transaction, okay? So in this case, what I'm going to do is avoid check number 1506. Okay, reverse transaction on June 6th, right, to Haley Rose, right? And that will be for the PO number 170303, right? Just, to, just so that we know what do you mean this transaction on the 6th, right? It's for the purchase order on um on the 6th, which was that uh, purchase order, right? I wrote here that I avoided the check, so I am reversing the transaction, okay? So now that I finished that first half, right, let's go ahead and reverse the money and so on and so forth, okay? And reverse this transaction. So here, let's go. We already did it on our check register, so let's go ahead and enter that into our actual ledger. So in this case, the money is going to go back to my checking account. Okay. All right, here's my checking account. I am not going to edit any line above that. Why? For instance, right here, this is my transaction on the daily, right? On my ledger is going to reflect the same exact amount, right? The same exact the way I have it on my journal. So if I separately have two transactions for that, I'm also going to have two separate transactions right here, right? I'm not going to just edit something that already happened, right? Because in this case, can that be possible? You would have to change the date, which isn't true. You didn't issue the, the check 1506 on the on the 7th. You issued it on the 6th. So in this case, this also gives you a means to also keep a really good track record of where everything went. In this case, I issued it on the 6th, but on the 7th, I canceled it. So this is even a more uh, just more meaningful, uh, detailed, um, a detailed way of keeping track of your transactions is that now that I void it, right, because I am keeping my transactions in there, I'm not deleting it, I'm not editing them, then therefore I'm going to keep adding and adding and adding, okay? So this will be a better way for you to, again, not only keep a closer track record of your um, transactions, but it allows you to not have any holes or, um, you know, uh, discrepancies that are in your actual transaction, right? You can actually see where it everything is going. So in this case, I put check number 1506 and I'm going to put void. Okay. And we are on journal page two here. And because I voided that transaction, I voided that check, it put the 1140 and 22 cents back into my checking account. So therefore, instead of taking it out, right, it's going to put it, that money back. So now I'm back to 11 361 and 29 cents. Okay? So that's what it means to put it back. And because I have my checking there, I also need to do the same thing to my prepaid accounts. Okay, here it is, prepaid accounts. Separate line because today's the seven, and what I'm gonna do here is void, voided um, third down payment on, or down pay on PO number 170303, okay? 
right? And if because I'm undoing it, it's going to take out that eleven forty and twenty two cents. We'll drop my prepaid accounts back down to six thousand six hundred and fifty four dollars and sixteen cents. Ooh, whoa! I got sixteen cents. What happened here? Oh. There's my first mistake. I made a typo already. It's supposed to be eleven forty and twenty two cents. There you go. Okay. So now that I finished my journal, right? What do I need to do to my subsidiary ledger? In this case, all you have to do is not much because in this case, right? I don't even owe Haley Bros anything right now, right? If I go down to Haley Bros, right, it says right here, the third uh, down payment for the purchase order, right, number 303, it still says I don't owe them anything. So in this case, what I can do here is I don't need to waste space and enter in that I canceled the check because what good does it do for you? You don't even owe Haley Bros in the first place. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to edit this right here and just say I voided the check. Right? Because in this case, it doesn't even matter right here, right? Because it doesn't matter if I have to draw in another line. How is going? How is this going to reverse the purchase order? Right? You're going to put in the same exact information, only difference is what? What are you going to do? Right? You're going to put the payment back? How are you going to do that? So in this case, there's really nothing that you could really do here except for make a note on here saying that you voided on 6-7 is good enough for this transaction here, okay? Because again, how, how, how are you going to use the subsidiary ledger to represent that you are voiding a payment, okay? So in this case, that's the only thing you can really do here is just enter in that you voided this transaction. Now... I do not want you to ever edit this in a point to the point where we have to change the date, we have to change the purchase order, we don't we have to change the, the the number. No. Leave it the way it is. Okay? I only want you to edit the note or edit the description. Do not edit anything other than that. Okay? Because it's unnecessary. Yes. I just want to make it clear um whether the check is already in the mail on the way to the uh, vendor mm -hmm. or I still have it in the pile of go out mail, it doesn't make any difference what we are doing. Well, if, it, if you haven't sent it out, yes, then go ahead and edit the entire transaction. Okay. Because in this case, you never, ma you never mailed it out. Okay. Right? In this case, yeah. you, you, of course, you can... Any, you can make you can make any adjustments, any editing if you did not mail out the check. But in this case, I've already mailed it out, and they okay. received it. That's why I got notified that it's the wrong amount. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so the check is in their hand, and they are the one who noticed that they we made a mistake on the amount. The yes. Figure. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But if you actually currently still have the check in your hands. Right? And even though you recorded everything the way you recorded, because it's the end of the day. Yes, that is going to be an occasion where you don't need to do all of this. You do technically, yes, you do need to void the check for sure. Right? Because you're going to be issuing a new check. Right? But in this case, you could scrap that one. Unless you're using an actual physical manual uh, checkbook, then no, you can't. You would actually have to... Um, you know, you actually have to void it. But in this case, right, in that case, if you're printing them out, you can override that 1506 and put it in for the correct amount because you haven't issued that checkout at all, period. So there's a lot of different rules if, in case you do have that scenario where you have, you come across that situation where you haven't sent them out the check, then that's fine. And then therefore, yes, you could, you would be able to edit this um, transaction right here, right in here without, you know, 
having major consequences for this, right? But in this case, we already sent it out. That's the assumption here. That's why we know it's wrong because they called us and said, hey, this isn't the correct amount. So in this case, that's why we have to issue a new check because they told us to. But we want to keep our preventative measures for them doubling, putting in their the payment for the checks in there. Okay. So in this case, right, because I've already sent it out, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to change any information here except for the description saying that I voided the check. Okay. So then now that we voided the check, right, now we can go ahead and do what we need to do, right? First things first is you need to go and revise that purchase order, okay? Now, how do I revise the purchase order? This one's kind of straightforward. You're just going to go into um, your purchase orders. Um, and in this case... Uh, let me see, what was it? Uh, 303, right, to Haley Bros. In this case, what are you really going to change? You're not supposed to put your um, your down payment in your purchase orders anyways because it doesn't, it, it's not so, you need to know how much they actually charge you for all the entire order, right? It's not like you're taking a discount on the items already, right, or they're discounted on the price. In this case, you need to make sure that those numbers do appear on your actual order form, right? That they didn't change or they didn't send you um, the wrong model or they didn't send you, um, you know, let's say, for example, they sent you a commercial coffee brewer, right? That was actually $3,000. No. This is what you need to keep in mind is that you're not editing any information except for what the purchase order is because, again, since you have a... Since you're going to be using that as a means for your down payment, then you're going to have to go ahead and do this. So you're going to go into here, and you're actually going to say you're going to make this an R. R for revised, okay? Not for revit, not for, not for refund, not for anything else, not for return. This is for revised, okay? So in this case, you can come up with any kind of numbering or lettering system that you want, right? If it was supposed to be uh, money that we're supposed to come back, I would use a credit instead of, um, instead of um, you know, revised or things like that, right? So in this case, that's what I want to let you know is we're going to re, re revise our uh, purchase order for 17-0303, uh, right? We know we revised it, right? But in this case, it's still for the same items. The down payment's not going to be recorded, right? So this is what we're going to be using now since it's being revised, since a third of the down payment isn't 111 40 It's actually 1178 right? Or it's 1170 178 So in this case, now that we've revised my purchase order, right, now I need to go ahead and go ahead and go through all the steps again. I need to go to my journal, right, because what do I need to do? I need to reissue them a new check, right? So that means I'm going to be putting in my down payment into my prepaid accounts. And since we know that we're going to issue them a new check, then it's going to come out of our checking account. So in this case, And this time it's for the correct amount of the eleven seventy one and eighty seven cents. Okay. Now your note here is going to be you're going to issue this out to Haley Bros, right? And this time it's for purchase order number seventeen zero three zero three R because it's been revised now. Um, it's still going to be that same third down payment on Grinder and Brewer. Okay, and we're going to be needing to write check number. Well, let's take a look at what our check number is. Okay. So we go back to my check register. 
So my next check I'm going to be writing out is 1507. Okay, for the 1171 and 87 cents. Make sure it's 87, not 78. Right? And who am I going to be writing this check out to? Haley Bros. Now be careful here. Now, once I typed in here, right, I, everything is going to be exactly the same. The only difference is you have the word voided on there. Yes, you can go ahead and, and claim that and then just try to erase the void. Just be careful not to include that void there. Okay. And what is it now? Reissue check for down payment for down pay on uh, brewer and grinder. Okay. Whatever you want to put your information here. So in this case, I'm going to be reissuing a new check for 1507 or check number 1507 for the correct amount of the 1171 and 80 seven cents okay so now i can complete my journal by saying i have check number 1507 so again Haley bros purchase order revised of the 303 for the same one-third down payment on the grinder and brewer and you use check number 1507 that's pretty much enough um detail to understand what this what this transaction is so now that we finished my journal, I wrote my check. Now I have to go ahead and complete my um, ledger, right? I'm already in my prepaid account, so you're gonna do the same exact thing, right? And you're gonna it, you're gonna go ahead and do um, everything. So one third down payment. So as you can see. But one thing I need to make a note here is it has to be the revised version, okay? We're still on general journal page two, right? Let's see do we how much more we have left. Okay, so we, we're almost done with page two, okay? And this time we're going to increase my uh, prepaid accounts by 1171 and 87 cents, okay? 11 71 and 87 cents. So therefore, that should increase my prepaid accounts to $7,826.04. Okay. All right. And now I need to go ahead and update my checking account. Okay. To reflect the same thing. Right? Well, not the same thing. To, to write check number 1507. Right? To go ahead and subtract that 1171 and 87 cents from my bank account. Now, it has dropped my checking account down to $10,189.42. Okay? All right, good so far. All right, so then now, because I issued out a new check to Haley Bros, now I need to record that into my subsidiary exactly how I recorded it in my uh, subsidiary ledger with that previous one, right? I'm going to record everything except had that word voided, right? And here's the difference. I have a new date, right? And you're still going to have that third down payment, right? In this case, it auto-filled for me, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to edit this information, right? Because we didn't void it, right? We wrote check number 1507, okay? And here's the difference, right? This was for purchase order 170303R. It's been revised, okay? <laughs> We're still on our journal number two. <laughs> okay. And the same thing's going to happen here, right? 
My purchase order 303 R now tells me that I owe eleven seventy one and eighty seven cents. And my check number fifteen oh seven proves I made a payment. Okay. So therefore I owe Haley Bros zero dollars. Okay. Now as you can see, one of them has been voided. So that eleven forty twenty two would have disappeared anyway. All right, but I want to keep a track record so then I have multiple areas to prove what happened to my check number 1506. It got voided, All right? All right, and here's this one. Check number 1507 has been reissued for the revised version of that purchase order, okay? And still, Haley Bros does not owe me anything, but the hopes is this amount needs to be applied to my bill once I received my coffee brewer and coffee grinder. Okay? So that's something that we have to keep in mind for. All right? So now that my journal, my ledger, and my subsidiary ledger has finally been completed, we can now go ahead and finish up this uh, transaction because we are completely done with this transaction, right? We did everything that we were supposed to. All right, so there you go. Here's the reverse and re-entry. And then again, here is to record the down payment for the correct amount with the revision of the purchase order. Okay. All right, so then let's see what happened next. So here was something that was we that I guess we let me actually let me see if here's something that maybe you could have seen suspicious. Why is it that I ordered um, my um, counter and my display shelves afterwards and I did not get it shipped? I and I end up receiving it first. Again, whatever order that the other vendor has received, they're going to fill them out. Now in this case, these items we end up shipping at the same time anyway. So now we end up receiving our desk set that we order from furniture store, right? So here it is, right? Invoice number 71. Here's the desk set for one. And here for that $562, here we got charged the sales tax and we also got charged some freight. So in this case, taking a look at this information here, Right? How much is my grand total for my actual desk set? Six fifty-eight thirty-seven. Six fifty-eight thirty-seven. Because this one, they already calculated everything for us already. Right? They already have the tax included, and they already have the shipping distributed correctly. So in this case, this is an example of. Uh, receiving something and you don't have to do any extra math because it's already been pre-calculated. So in this case, right, what should we do first? Well, since we forgot to fill out our purchase order to begin with, let's go ahead and do that one first and then we'll journalize the rest. So let's acknowledge that we have received our desk set on the 7th, right? So here you go, furniture store for the desk set. I have received it on June 7. All right. Okay, for the uh, date. And I want it to look like that. Okay. And we need to fix that one more time, right? Because it's June 7. And this time, what was my invoice number for this desk? 71. Invoice number 71. So now we confirm that we received the correct one, right? It was for $562, right? That was correct. All right, we need to get a, a different desk here. We got the same exact one. This time we end up getting extra charges such as sales tax and um, shipping, okay? So now that I verified that I received my items, now we need to verify if this account exists in our books. Do we actually have a desk 
available in our chart of accounts. Yes. Yes, you do. 13030 is going to be your desk set. Now, how am I going to pay for this? So far, it's account payable. Correct, right? Because in this case, right, we've talked about this, right? We're the very, 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 very beginning portion of our business, right? We are setting up our business. Right now, if they give us terms, we're going to take advantage of it because you don't know what future things that we need to pay for with cash, right? We need to pay for to get things done, right? In this case, they build us and they said you have 15 days to pay this bill off. So what we're going to do is take advantage of that billing, okay? So in this case, we're going to acknowledge that since we're going to owe furniture store more money, right? We're going to go ahead and assign this to an accounts payable. Okay? So here, we acquired a fixed asset. Okay? For the total amount of $658.37. And we're going to owe it on and on our furniture store account. Okay. And we have every piece of information that we need to, to, to fill this out, right? We know exactly who sent us the bill, furniture store. Right, what was the proof of our transaction? They billed us with invoice number 71. Anything else? Well, you could say they place it on an account for net 15. And that's pretty much it. You don't need to fill in that you bought a desk because this is pretty self-explanatory. Okay. And that should be it. Okay. All right. So now that we finish our journal, what's next? Ledger. We gotta do our ledger, right? So in this case, we have a desk set and we have an accounts payable. So desk set is an asset, it's a fixed asset. So let's see, it's gonna fall under the category of furniture. So here's my furniture. We got the bistro tables and chairs. We got the counter. Here you go, the desk set. Today's the seventh. How much was the desk set? Well, it was $652 plus the 8.25% tax, which was, how much was the tax? Tax was $46.37 and the delivery charge was $50. $46.37. Forty six thirty seven plus shipping or plus fifty dollar shipping. Right. Post reference still on page two here. And we're gonna debit our account for six hundred and fifty eight dollars and thirty seven. Okay. Now that we finished putting in our desk set, we need to update our liabilities. Okay. So once again, we increased our liabilities because we received an invoice, right? We got billed. Invoice number 71, and, right, we, we chose not to pay, so we're going to increase the amount that we owe by $658.37, okay? Which will increase my entire balance, right, because a credit will increase. Since we're increasing the amount that we owe, we now owe a grand total of $3,428.67. Okay. All right.
right. So now that we finished our journal, we finished our ledger. Now we need to update our subsidiary ledger because now I actually owe furniture store more money. Okay. So it should be a couple lines above. Here it is, furniture store. What did we buy? We bought one desk set. You want to put all the information in there. In this case, we already know um, it's going to have tax and everything in there. So if you want to say one desk set, that's fine. We know this was invoice number 71. Okay. We're still on General Journal page two. We also got the same net 15. So therefore, what day is this bill due on? Oh, it'll be the 22nd of June. Good, right, so again, if you wanna use Excel to do the calculation for you, all you gotta do is you gotta select the date, make sure it's formatted in date, okay? And then you're gonna plus 15, right? And that should give you 15 days from now, which is going to be June 22nd, okay? How much was the bill outstanding for? $658.37. We didn't make a payment, so therefore, I should owe this amount. So I can just drag and copy my formula all the way down, right? So then now, that gave me an increase of $658.37. So now, let's take a look at here. If you remember, in the gray is your totals, right? So I can use this to give me my grand total right here saying that in grand total, I owe furniture store $2,423.67, right? That doesn't tell me how many bills I have with them. That just tells me how much I owe to this vendor in general. And that's what I want to see, right? Even though when I take a look in detail of my columns I have here, right, I currently owe two bills, right, that equal that $2,423, $28, okay? Right, so now that I see this, it's just tallying up my totals on what I owe and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. And I believe that is it for that transaction. Okay. Next we have here is that we end up starting our water. Okay. So we end up having water from the Las Vegas City Service. Wait. We started our water and the Las Vegas City Services. So again, um, trash. If they, need, if they require street cleaning, that's all included, right? Because it's the city services, okay? And since those were all go gonna be turned on through Envy Utilities, they don't require any down payment or a deposit. They just simply already started up the system, right? They started the water flow, and, they, and then now that when we receive our bill, we will know how much water we used and how much the... Um, city services charge us, okay, in July. But in this case, that's good to know. So you know that, you know, you're not going to be surprised when you receive your bill, right? At least you know that you're going to be charged for water and you're going to be charged for those city services, okay? All right, and then last but not least, it tells us right here, we can start creating our trial balance. So what I'm going to do here is let's stop here and we'll take a break. Now, before you do anything, right, I want you to save your spreadsheets all the time, okay? Because in this case, we are completely done with our, um, our book for now, right? We're completely done with our week one uh, of transactions, right? We just, tra we just journalized seven days worth of transactions. Now, What's the purpose of having a trial balance in between? Now, usually you're supposed to do it at the end of the month, but for you guys, since we're beginners, right? This is where we're learning 
and practicing how to properly journalize our transactions. And this is where a lot of our mistakes can happen. Okay? So that's why it's extremely important that for the sake of this class that we complete a trial balance at the end of every coffee cafe week. So every seven days, we will complete a trial balance just to ensure the accuracy of our accounting, right? Just, be sh just to make sure that when we're transferring money from one account to another, are we making our mistakes in between? Are we making typos in between? Do we not make sure that our total debits match our total credits in our journal, right? And was the transferring process from journal to ledger accurate as well, okay? So in this case, this is where we're going to be taking a look and making sure that when we were doing our accounting, that we properly put our um, you know, amounts in the proper accounts. Okay, that's the only purpose of this. So what I'm going to do is this is what I normally do for um, my journal is I like to block off a certain section right here just so then I can, you know, um, start my trial balance, right? Making sure that the transactions between um, May 31st all the way to January to, to June 7th, excuse me. I want to ensure that all of those transactions ha are okay. So what I like to do here is I like to put in a little block in here by filling it out right here. So I'm going to use black so it's kind of like in your face. And I'm actually going to make a note here, right, that this is for me to prepare for my very first trial balance. Now, you don't have to do this, but like I said, it, it may, to me, it's organizingly pleasing because then what happens is if I am successful with my trial balance, right, that means, okay, that means I know exactly where my mistake will fall, right? So if, I, if, my, if my trial balance for week one is perfect evenly out for between um, all my debits and all my credits, and they matched out to be completely um, equal to each other, right? That means for the first seven days of my transactions, I, was, I did this completely correct and completely accurate. Now again, if you made a typo, right, and you end up making a typo for both accounts, yes, that will be much harder to actually find the um, mistake there. But this is just another way just to ensure that the first seven days of transaction are good to go. So that means the next child balance, if you end up having a, um, a discrepancy where you have too many debits and too many in, and not enough credits, right? then you're able to segregate saying at least the first seven days of transaction were fine. That means my mistake must have happened in the next seven days, right? Between the 8th and the 14th, right? And there's no way that the first seven days had my mistake because my trial balance came out to be even, okay? Now, do you need to record your numbers on your trial balance here? It is up to your discretion, right? I don't. I just make sure that this is what it looks like in my journal that I'm separating my transactions to make sure that if my trial balance has a discrepancy, then there's something that I made a mistake between the first seven days. If not, and my next trial balance does, like I mentioned before, right, then my mistake is between the next set of transactions. So in this case, that's all I'm doing here is, so then when I'm scrolling back up and down, right, instead of having to find the last date in your transactions, this one kind of gives you a clear direction that, Boom, this is where you stopped to do, to do your trial balance, okay? So that's what I like to normally do. And again, I really highly encourage you to save your work at all times, right? Because the thing about um, Microsoft is if you guys are using the 365, it is using a cloud-based service right now. So, um, so even if you your computer decides to shut down on you for any random reason, 
your computer overheats. It will save maybe the last thing that you did on there, but it won't actually save it. You, it will, it will, it will have that. Um, what do you call it? When you're when the computer when the program crashes, it has that auto recovery um, program, right? But still, you yourself have to save that transaction. Okay, but it will catch it if in case those things fall. That's what the auto recovery does. However, it is rule of thumb that if you are, you know, not having a very high uh, processing computer, laptop, or whatever you're using, right? It's a it is a rule of, uh, you know, recommendation to save your work as frequently as possible. Okay, if you're using Google Sheets. Right, those things automatically save for you because it's using the online services for the cloud base. For um, you know, when you sign up with Google, it has that for you automatically, and it will save everything for you automatically. Okay, so there, are, that's just a couple rules of thumbs there. Now, for the trial balance, you won't need anything except for your general ledger and your financial statements. Okay, you only need the journal in case you actually have a discrepancy. Okay. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna go ahead and stop here and take a break real quick. And then when we come back, we'll complete our trial balance and we'll end the day, okay?